The UCP's annual general meeting wrapped up in Red Deer over the weekend. Premier Daniel Smith received a ringing endorsement from the five to 6,000 party members who attended. Now to chat about this in more detail is our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, Tyler Dawson, who joins us once again from Edmonton. Tyler, the UCP had their leadership review and Smith received a 91.5% approval rating. Does this really vindicate the work she did over the summer to maybe appease the grassroots within the party? It, it's a really good question. Um, th the way the UCP runs their annual general meetings is pretty much any member can show up. You, but you buy a membership, I think you need it like 21 days in advance, and, and then you can go and then you can vote. In this case, um, there was no advance voting. So, you know, if we recall the leadership race back in 2022, it wasn't just day of voting, there was mail in ballots and things like that as well. So, so this review was strictly the 6,000 people who attended, I think about 4,800 people or so voted. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's a bit of a complicated question because yeah, it's, it's a massive endorsement. Um, but it is also the endorsement just of the 6,000 people who are there. So it, it, what it is though, is it, it, it sidesteps one of these questions that has sort of dogged conservative party leadership reviews for a long time. And that is what is the sort of threshold needed to stick around? Um, we look back to Jason Kenney's leadership review in 2022. He got 51.4%, I think. He said, well, that's not enough to stick around. Ralph Klein got 55 or so percent back in 2007, I think. That was not enough for him to stick around. Um, Alison Redford got 77%. I believe she's stuck around for a bit longer than that. But it's it's always been a bit of an open question. You know, what is this threshold? Um, and and who uh, whose, whose views are sort of being represented in, in one of these leadership reviews? You know, many on social media were saying that was really, we're really sad is that you had tens of thousands of other party faithful who didn't get the opportunity, like you said, to vote on the leadership. But that's just really how it works with the AGM, doesn't it? Yeah, that is how it works. Um, certainly how it worked this time. You know, the, the, the UCP is a huge party, right? It's one of the biggest political parties in the country. And this, as it happens, was also probably one of the largest political conventions ever held in Canada. But, you know, you have, you've had at times up to about 130,000 people who are members of the United Conservative Party. Um, and so 6,000 people is, you know, a, a fraction of, of that total number. Um, and, you know, one of the things that happens at these conventions is you have the most enthusiastic, the most committed, the most fired up group of people who were there. And the UCP has had a demographic shift isn't quite the right term, but you've had a lot of people sign up for the party in the last couple of years who are sort of new to party politics. Maybe they were longtime conservative voters, but they were now really upset about COVID-19, for example, vaccines, the lockdown stuff. And you had a lot of these people that got involved with the party in the last couple of years. A lot of them were involved in Jason Kenney um, stepping down at the end of the day. So you, you have this situation where you have a, a bunch of new, really fired up members who are very um, animated by certain things they're going to the conventions, they're spending the money. Um, and then you have this other, you know, 120,000 people, perhaps who maybe are, they, they may well be new members as well. But they could also be some of these more longer term committed volunteers, party members, the ones putting out signs, making phone calls that just don't go to the convention. And, and you're right, we, we, we have no idea what, you know, all of those people think. Now, you had a chance to chat with Premier Daniel Smith, Tyler. She said the AGM was really about being a policy generating workshop. And now she'll work on policy to make sure that it's supported by the majority of Albertans. Could this maybe potentially backfire with her base? Well, it, it could. Um, the thing about a convention is you're obviously talking about the most conservative policy. Um, it would be the same at a liberal convention. You're talking about the most liberal policy. Um, when it comes time to turn that into legislation, turn that into regulations, you know, there's some stuff probably at the convention that might not be that palatable to the, you know, 4.8 million other Albertans out there. So that was sort of the question I put to Smith, because she's worked very hard over the past six months, as you alluded to off the top, to um, talk with her party's grassroots, to answer any and all questions that have come before her, to introduce legislation last week with the amended Bill of Rights, with the pronoun policy stuff. These were obvious policies put in place, announced to try and make her party's grassroots happy because those are things that her party's grassroots wanted. The question in all of these circumstances is really how do you sell that to the rest of the public? And so the, the sort of political jargon for this is do we see a pivot coming out of this? Do we see her turn towards some of the other issues that are out there, education, affordability, healthcare, whatever? Um, 
But then if you have this really animated group of policymakers who attended the convention, who voted for these 35 new policy resolutions, who are really fired up, um, if they don't see movement on that, yeah, they might get mad. They might, they could push in theory for another leadership review, as happened with Jason Kenney. They could get upset and, you know, try and try and turf her the next time there's a leadership review. They could stay at home in the next election if they're mad enough. So there is the possibility that this backfires. But of course, and that's the eternal question for any political leader is what do you do that's going to make your party happy? What do you do that's going to appeal to the voters across the rest of the province? Um, so that's something certainly to watch in the days ahead. You know, do these policy resolutions turn into government policy or are they going to sort of walk and chew gum and maybe work on some of this in the background, maybe turn towards some of these bread and butter issues that appeal to a large larger swath of the electorate. Um, it's an open question, but in a party like the UCP, this sort of Franken party from two different conservative traditions, the PCs and the Wild Rose, with all these new really animated members, it is certainly something I think that the Premier and her staff are keeping in mind. I have to remember that. Right after Halloween, Franken party. There you go. Tyler, all 35 policy resolutions passed. Now, ironically, a debate over returning to the flat tax was probably one of the closer votes. There was also some debate over declaring CO2 a foundational nutrient for life. Yeah, the, the flat tax one was kind of funny. We were all sitting there at the at the media table and all the yes votes went up and then all the no votes went up. And, and one of my colleagues leaned over and said, it, was that the closest one we've seen so far? And I said, yeah, well, I think so, actually, which is really weird because, you know, that's a classic conservative policy. That was the the, poli the income tax policy that the PCs had for, you know, the 40 years or so they were in government, and it was changed under Notley. Um, and there was a little bit of debate about it, too. Some people saying that they thought that the, a progressive income tax was a good idea. And then a couple people that said, well, the progressive income tax actually helps me, but I, I'm, you know, on the point of principle in favor of a flat tax. So it, it was kind of an odd circumstance, which I think goes to show some of the odd things that are happening within this party right now, that you've got multiple conservative traditions, you've got this real populist streak running through it, that something like that um, would even be controversial. And you're right, there were a bunch of other things that were debated. You know, there was some stuff about... Um, whether transgender women should be allowed in women's washrooms. There was the CO2 is an essential nutrient thing. Um, there was some debate on that one. There was one young man who stood up and said, well, water is an essential nutrient, but you can certainly still drown if you're in too much of it. Um, and there was debates over diversity and inclusion policy in the government. Um, it was a whole, a real gamut of stuff, a lot of social policy, a lot of cultural policy. Um, there was another debate about uh, making uh, gender reassignment surgery privately funded, so it would no longer be covered by public health care. That also passed. Um, there was a ban on sexually explicit performances in publicly funded spaces so that minors can't be, couldn't be exposed to it. Um, a whole pile of stuff. Um, and, and so as we just talked about, you know, how much of this turns into government policy, how much of this just sort of stays in the UCP policy playbook. Um, it's hard to say because, of course, if you're Ned Nenshi in the NDP, you're looking at some of this and saying, well, oh, bring it on. We'd love to fight an election over some of this mm -hmm. stuff. So, Tyler, let me ask you something. When you covered the AGM in Red Deer on Friday and Saturday, did you see more progressive conservatives, social conservatives, or was it kind of split down the middle? The, I would say, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, usually, you'd see in the debates over policy, you'd, you'd be able to see some of those distinctions relatively clearly. Um, if there were progressive conservatives there, they did not expend a whole lot of their energy arguing against some of the socially conservative policies. Um, and the thing that I found really interesting about this is, is we all watched Stephen Harper as prime minister, and he worked very, very hard to, on one hand, keep his social conservative um, base happy, but also he didn't really legislate on many socially conservative issues. Um, it was not something that he felt was going to benefit his party. It was going to be a real electoral risk when they were fighting over seats in you know, the GTA or the Vancouver area. Um, to go down this road. And and that does not seem to be the way that the UCP is approaching this right now. And I think part of it is there, there are certainly social conservatives who are very concerned about um, medical treatment for transgender minors or pronouns in schools, things like that. Um, those are not necessarily the issues that really animate progressive conservatives that, you know, they're, they're not super hyped about having this fight. That doesn't mean they don't agree with it, though. Um, and they, that doesn't mean that they don't think that these policies can be sold as sort of common sense policy ideas to the rest of Alberta. So I think that's probably why you didn't see a whole lot of debate on some of these topics, that even if people, these aren't their policy priorities, even if they maybe don't think this is the wisest um, 
policy direction to be going, they, they may still agree with it. So I, I would say, generally speaking, yeah, there, there seem to be a lot of social conservatives um, Although maybe they wouldn't identify as such, right? You know, if you, th you think social conservatives, you maybe think people who are really still animated by abortion, for example, or same-sex marriage. Um, I certainly heard nothing about either of those things, although there were um, some anti-abortion advocates, pro-life advocates there. But it, it certainly was people who were um, in favor of or excited by some of this social and cultural policy, I think is, is probably fair to say. And you know, Tyler, polling has shown that Albertans are very concerned about health care, education, and affordability. Some of that was discussed at the convention, including calls for tax cuts and eliminating smart smartphones in classrooms. Now, there's also health care reform underway with large amounts of money to fund new schools. Will the province see any tangible results? Well, that's sort of the million dollar question, I think, after, you know, the millions of dollars are spent. Um, this government has been walking and chewing gum at the same time. I, I think that's fair to say, you know, a lot of attention has been given to some of these cultural policies that we've just talked about. But there is this massive AHS reform going on in the background. There is this new funding that's been announced for 30 or something new schools, like every year for the next five years or something like that. Like there, this, this is also happening, right? Um, so, but but it does seem like a lot of the premier's attention has been on some of these other issues. And, you know, I heard from people who said, "Look, going into this convention, her her top political priority had to be surviving the leadership review. So it makes sense that there's going to be a lot of focus on that. And honestly, the media is happier to focus on um, cultural policy and stuff because it's it's more exciting than trying to figure out what the heck is happening with AHS reform, which is <laughs> always complicated and hard to figure out." Um, but because those are the polling priorities that Albertans talk about all the time, um, that is something I think that the government is is thinking about and will need to think about. And you'd mentioned results. Of course, the obvious place where you need to see results is in healthcare. Are wait times going down? Are people getting surgery more expeditiously? Um, are health outcomes improving over the next couple of years? And part of the reason I think why why um, some of that stuff isn't at the fore right now, the, the tax cut being a great example. The government announced this during the 2023 election campaign, they have not implemented an income tax cut. Well, the election's not for another two and a half years or so. Um, some of those results, some of those cuts, some of those policies, they're going to want to do in the lead up to the election, as opposed to doing it now, and then maybe everyone forgets about it when it's time to cast a ballot. And a special debate was held Saturday on the Alberta Bill of Rights. Let's talk about that for a moment here. Some amendments were announced last week by the government, but a number of convention goers were upset that they really didn't go far enough. Can you explain? Yeah, so there had been consultations over the past sort of year on what to do about the Alberta Bill of Rights. And earlier in the summer, late summer, I guess it would have been, there was this draft Bill of Rights that went around the Conservative Party. And it was developed by a, a number of activists and lawyers calling themselves the Black Hats Gang. And this ended up being endorsed by the UCP's board of directors, this this particular document. Now, very few of the items in that document actually made it into the proposed amendments last week. The exception to that, perhaps, is sort of protection um, for the rights of the unvaccinated. Um, and that document goes quite a bit further um, in a way that I, I would suggest would be rather hard to sell to the majority of Albertans. You know, it includes the right to concealed carry of firearms. Um, it includes a, a clause on right to life beginning at conception, which would obviously have implications for reproductive rights. Um, it allows the use of lethal force to prevent a crime being committed. Um, those sorts of things that would, that are you know very, very conservative policies um, that certainly would be, I think, a tough sell in, in downtown Calgary, Edmonton or somewhere like that. Now, that document came up for debate and, and basically it was a little bit confusing because this was not a policy resolution. So it's not in the UCP policy handbook. It was just a special debate on this. But the party did vote sort of overwhelmingly in favor of these amendments, these suggestions to be incorporated into the Bill of Rights. So what we'll need to look for in the next week or two is as the amended Bill of Rights, I think it's Bill 24 um, that was announced last week, um, we will need to see what amendments come in at sort of the committee phase. Do any of these suggestions get incorporated or is the government just going to leave it alone and, and sort of hope for the best? So apparently at the convention, there was a movement afoot to have Daniel Smith dismissed for not moving aggressively enough on some of the COVID-related subject matter, but it failed, Tyler. So does this maybe suggest that the influence held by some of the party's power brokers, like a 1905 committee in Take Back Alberta, is maybe a bit overstated or perhaps they're losing some of their influence? 
Yeah, well, they had a lot of power um, when it came to getting rid of Jason Kenney. You know, that movement was very, very influential. They got, they, you know, to some extent are responsible for getting rid of Jason Kenney. They are to some extent responsible for Daniel Smith being elected as leader. I, I think that's fair to say. That's probably not overstating their influence. But I I, th I think you're right. You know, this there was not that much indication at this convention that 91.5% approval of Daniel Smith really suggests that the people who are the most angry with her, the people that really wanted to see her go, don't have that much power right now. They, they were certainly, they were certainly, um, they were certainly lobbying, you know, they were handing out pamphlets and, and things like that to try and sway people's votes a little bit. Um, but it doesn't seem to have really materialized. So, you know, they did a lot of work to sign up a bunch of new members. A lot of these new members are sort of the result of these campaigns to get rid of Jason Kenney and have Smith elected in the first place. So very influential in that regard. But it, you know, in terms of them being sort of behind the scenes puppet masters who uh, who who are able to play queen maker kind of thing, you you did not see that this weekend. I think that's fair to say. He's our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Thanks again for joining us today from Edmonton. Thanks for having me, Hal.